Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to this week's study. As we continue going through these verses and in the conversations that we've had the last couple of days, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his direction and his guidance so that we may more clearly understand that which we need to know at this time? Shall we now ask for his guidance in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we have great need of you. We ask for your forgiveness of our sins. We ask for your direction in this study. We ask that you join with us, send your spirit and your angels to protect us, to guide us, to show us that which we need. Help us now. Be with us, Father. May your will be done. There are many things that are happening now of which we have no understanding. But we know that you see and understand all. Direct us according to your will. Guide us so that we might come to understand. For this we thank you and this we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now, the last couple of days, we have been going over Daniel 11, verses 14 to 16. Now, we're going to be returning to this portion of Daniel 16, in, or 11, 16, in just a moment. Now, a premise long ago was presented that involved Daniel eleven fourteen, And that verse, of course, reads, And in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of thy people, or as the margin reads, the children of the robbers of thy people, shall exalt themselves to establish the calzone, the vision, but they shall fall. The premise established long time ago was that in Daniel 2, we see Rome introduced. In Daniel 7, we see a continuation with Rome. So in Daniel 11, when we're introducing the concept of the children of the robbers of thy people, can this be anyone except Rome? What say you? Okay, so, I mean, we know Rome is introduced somewhere. So we're going to have Rome. It's going to be part of this vision. So the idea that a Tychus Epiphanes is going to be here, obviously that can't be correct. Now, some people could argue argue that this is really all just about, you know, Greece, but then you have some major problems. And we know that people try to force a Tychus Epip Epiphanes into here. And some Christians, because so many commentaries have a Tychus Epiphanes, they they just think that that's the way it is. But that's that's inconsistent, especially with all the different symbols that are given. So we would have to say that, um, you know, it's it's definitely Rome, especially since there's so many other symbols that point to Rome. But exactly where Rome is introduced, this describes Rome, especially as as we see that Rome becomes the king of the north in verse 16. But Rome is introduced in verse 14, the breaker of the robbers of thy people. And, and one of the symbols that, that we have that's kind of interesting is the fact that when we take the, those Hebrew numbers and add them together, one, one, two, one, and uh, what's the other one? Okay, I'm on the wrong page here. Yeah, so go one, one, two, one, and what was it? Six, five, three, zero. And you add them together and you get 7651, the Hebrew number for that's the seven times in Leviticus 26. And that it fits in. So there's so many things that fit that show that it has to be Rome, that it has to be connected to what we understand about it. Now, so I don't think it's circular reasoning. I think there's lots of different ev evidences. Okay. So that's, hopefully that, that helps. Okay. So as we, as we had worked through verse 14, mm -hmm. we are hearing again and identifying that many will stand up against the king of the south. Do the robbers of thy people, also called the children of the robbers of thy people, or the breakers of thy people, do they stand up against the king of the south? Rome does not stand up against the king of the south. How does Rome not stand up against the king of the south? Well, Rome stand. Um, how does Rome not? 
Well, yeah. Rome is supporting the king of the south. But does Rome always support the king of the south? Oh, well, not after it becomes the king of the north. Correct. So when Daniel is giving reference here to the robbers of thy people, he is introducing a element that may stand for a while with the king of the south, but will, as you're noting, become the breakers. That they're they're talking here as Daniel is being given the vision that this is the robbers, the breakers, or the children of the robbers of Israel, of Jerusalem, of thy people. Yeah. Now, you say children, but I know that the word is actually sons. So the sons of the robbers of thy people. And so the reason it's not the robbers of thy people, but the sons of the robbers of thy people. So why is it called the sons of the robbers of thy people? Not just the robbers of thy people. Why is sons, sons in there? Is it those that will follow? Well, will follow what? The pattern laid down by their predecessors. Well, so the question is, who the who are the predecessors? Are we not establishing that this is not Greece, but this is Rome? Well, this is Rome, right? But the question is, why is Rome called the sons of the robbers of thy people? Who first robs God's people? Pagan Rome. Well, but this is pagan Rome. It's not describing anything other than pagan Rome. So pagan Rome can't be the sons of itself. What we would, what, what I think, what, uh, how I would understand it, this goes back to Babylon. Because Babylon passes on its characteristic to Rome. And how right. does it do so? How did we clearly show that Rome and Babylon, that Rome becomes Babylon in a sense? How did we show that? Didn't we see this directly in Daniel 2? Well, we don't. So we, we see the progression of these kingdoms, but there's a characteristic that Rome inherits from Babylon. And that characteristic has to do with the 666 years. So we have the siege of Leviticus 26, which is Jehoiachin's captivity, right? And Jehoiachin, Jehoiachin's captivity is 666 years before the siege that's described in Deuteronomy 28 the siege by Rome of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So there's 666 years that connect Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. So could the sons of the robbers of thy people say that Rome has a certain characteristic that Babylon has, and that's going to be leading us to what happens with the siege? That's going to be mentioned a couple of verses later. I would think that it's possible that Rome has those characteristics. Yeah. Okay. Because, you know, we've always just said, well, the robbers of thy people is Rome, but it's actually the sons of the robbers of thy people. And, you know, most people don't have a way to connect, connect that. Why is it the sons of the robbers of thy people? Now, for those who are going to put Antiochus epiphanies in here, obviously, you know, Tychus Epiphany can't be the sons of the robbers of thy people, but Rome can. All right. The point, the further point is, is I would had to consider this, where the sons of the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the calzone. Oh. We can see if we are looking at this from a numerical standpoint that this is establishing a 1,260-year vision tying pagan Rome to this time period. And that yes. since this is the calzone, that there would follow a 1,260-year period that ties it to papal Rome. Okay. So I see how you're looking at it. So you're saying you're trying to put papal Rome in here or not? No, I'm I'm looking at papal room from a present truth aspect, but this verse is specific to a pagan Rome aspect. Okay. Yes. 
So, so one of the things we have here is the word kazon has in it, the Hebrew number uh, has in it some symbols. It's 2300 plus 77, right? The word itself. Right. Okay. So we can see the 2300 days there and we can see the 70, right? Mm-hmm. And then the seven. So you could take it out and lay it on 2300 and then 70 and then seven, right? Three different numbers. Right. And of course, 70 times seven is the 70 weeks. So you have these, uh, the Kazone contains the 2300 days and the 70 weeks. They're both different portions of the same great prophetic period. Right. Okay. So the Kuzone is the 2520 as a symbol. Now, we also know that Kuzone is first mentioned in Daniel chapter 7, but with the Hebrew, not with the Hebrew number, but with the Aramaic number, 2376. Now, if we take the 76 number, we, we can see how that relates to the 777 structure, because we know that um, when we go from November 9th, 1989 to December 25th, 1991, that it's 776 cardinal days, 777 days inclusive. And, and we also have that number for audits for the land that is the Hebrew number 776. So, so what would that mean in Daniel 7, that it has the Hebrew number 2376 instead of the number 2377? Could, could we say that that relates to um, that symbol? That would be an interesting point. Yeah. Okay. So there is a lot of symbols here that would tie us to the idea that the Kazone, the 2520, has a connection to how our history as well. And that would be more a present truth symbol, obviously. But here we're looking at it primarily what we've been trying to do is look at the, at the historic application. But we do always want to consider how does this affect the present truth application. So we know, of course, Rome extols itself to establish the vision in our history in connection uh, with the events that that lead up to November 9th, 1989, right? That's how we've looked at it. So I don't know, any any other thoughts on that? And hopefully that's helpful. So, because we, we had taken verse 14 to relate to, you know, the Soviet-Afghan war and Reagan and Pope John Paul and solidarity and the Soviet Union and 126 shekels, um, you know, that lead to from 1863 to 1989, extending that uh, prophetic mirror into our history. And uh, so that's how we looked at it yesterday. And, and it seems to fit. And when it says they shall fall in the history of pagan Rome, that's going to be 476 AD. In papal Rome, that's going to be 1798 right, historic application. It's just talking about what will happen. Uh, but we can relate that in the present truth application to the close of probation in the seven last plagues. So it's just pointing way ahead that even though Rome exalts itself to establish the vision, it's it's going to fall just as pagan and papal Rome fell. So I think verse 14 is pretty solid. Okay. Now, verse 15, so the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount, and take the most fenced cities. And the arms of the south shall not withstand, neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. Do we have anything else in this verse, either from a historic or a present truth application, that we should be addressing? Okay, from a contextual application, this verse has three parties. We have the king of the north, we have the king of the south, and we have the chosen people, which, as I would uh, presume, would be the chosen people of the king of the south, 
Are there any other thoughts regarding that application? Okay, so the choicest people historically, um, I mean, we have it there, but we didn't put in our interpretation specifically who the choicest people were. We know it's not referring to Israel. It's not talking about the chosen people, right? It's the, the chosen people of the South. Of the king of the South, yes. Yeah, and and so we have a present truth application that that's the global elites, but who would the chosen people of the king of the south be specifically historically smith was trying to to apply that as being scopus and the armies that scopus had reigned had had raised okay and and that makes sense right because the king of the south is in that historical application is choosing um you know it's choosing something from rome Right. Or, you know, connected to Rome in some way, even though it's not directly Rome. So it's it's a characteristic. Now, then we but if we're making the present truth application, do we believe that the global elites are connected to Rome in some way? Even though they're not directly Rome, that is, is are the global elites doing the work of papal Rome in our history? Okay, another question, I guess. But so, could we say that the Jesuit conspiracy has some connection to spiritualism? That would be a simple way of asking the question. Yeah, because the the way that I was having to consider this is: are these chosen people are they more linked with spiritualism than they are with Rome? Well, they, they yeah. So the King of the South is spiritualism, right? That's the, the dragon power. But we understand, at least I have always understood, that the papacy is behind the dragon power in some way, even though they're an enemy, right? Even though we can say, well, atheism is not directly papal, yet it is. So, you know, back years ago, when you know I started studying all this um the conspiracy theories, we'll call them theories, but there is a conspiracy of, of the Jesuits, right? That's, it's not a conspiracy theory. It's something that's plainly taught in the spirit of prophecy. So when we have what happens in France, who, who is that power, according to Ellen White in the Great Controversy? What, what does she name? What group that we can, um, that, that exists in spiritualism that is part of that Jesuit conspiracy. She names a group. We don't usually talk about the name of that group, but it's well known historically. The Jacobins? Yeah, the Jacobins, right? So who are the Jacobins? Aren't they the ones that, that fomented the revolution within France? Yes. And so so who are they? Yes, they're the ones that fomented the revolution in France. And do they have any connection to what happens in the Soviet Union later in the Russian Revolution? Well, the, the comment that was made by um, Engel was that the Jacobins of the French Revolution are the communists of today. Right. Okay. But And so where do the Jacobins come from? Where does this, this power originate? Now, it's obviously a satanic power, but historically, how, how do we end up with the Jacobins? Is it something disconnected that just shows up by itself, or does it come from Rome? No, it, it comes from Rome. I mean, the, the situation was that the the Jesuits in their teaching and in the way that they had supported the the kings in France had basically showed themselves that they were not directly supporting the common people as many would have thought. Yeah. Now, th this reminds me a little bit of um, an error that has been promoted by, uh, oh, what's his name? It just slips my mind at the moment. It's, it's um, Walter Weith. So he promotes the idea that Islam was started by the papacy, 
Right. Which I find zero basis for in reality. Uh, that means the papacy would have had, uh, prior to the rise of the Jesuits, the foresight to start this religion way over in Arabia that's then going to become this major power that they're going to do all these wars against. Right? There, there's just... It's just such a hard conspiracy theory for me to believe. But we do know that the Jesuits, because they exist, are the originators of what we would now call communism. Now, why do they do that? What, how, how would we connect to this, to what we're reading here? Well, they would want the elites to be in control. Because if they then control the elites or the few then the few are controlling the many. Okay. Now, so is it just something that gets out of control when they want to conquer the Soviet Union? Or because we know that France, the Pope's going to be taken captive by this power. That is the French Revolution. So is it something that just got out of hand? They started something that they then couldn't control? Or is it that... Uh, they were working out their purposes through what happened in 1798. Like that, that's, you know, because that's part of the problem that you have is if the papacy created this power, was the power doing something that the papacy wanted in, in everything that happened in the French, French Revolution? Is there some like bigger plan? And, and I say that there is, and that's that Satan who is the one behind it that that there's things about these conspiracies that men themselves are not in control of. Right. No, the, the situation, there are those that would think that this, especially with what happened in France, that this just got out of control. But had that been the, the situation, then Rome would have fallen not long after the French Revolution. Yeah, I mean, and in a sense, they kind of did, right? They received a deadly wound. Now, so so let's kind of think about this a little bit more because this is something we've never discussed okay. uh, in any of our studies. So when we go back to what happens with apostate Christianity, what what becomes the papacy, right? So it doesn't start out as the papacy. You know, the papacy tries to say, well, we began with, you know, St. Peter. And you know, obviously they didn't, right? That's St. Peter wasn't an apostate uh, Christian. Right. And and the papacy develops over time. I mean, you have bishops of these different cities that would be, you know, elders, right? They're, they're going to be existing. <clears throat> and you start to have politics entering into Christianity. But they are still Christian. It's not like they're the papacy in, you know, in the time of Constantine. You don't have the papacy yet. We, we would agree with that? I could agree with something like that. Yeah. So so we do have Christianity that's that's apostate, but it, it's not what we would call the papacy. They don't, they, you know, they're not the persecuting power, right? They're, they're, they're just apostate Christianity. And... Um, but because they are apostate, they they are in control by Satan, right? Satan is controlling them. So as time goes on, this this power, which we call pagan Rome, uh, begins to adopt Christianity. They start to merge, right? It happens gradually. You know, we could say it starts with Constantine. But Constantine, you know, we can't say what happens in the fourth century, is is pagan is is papal it's we could say it's we could say it's rome it's christianity it's roman christianity that starts to dominate but it's still not the papacy the the bishop of rome is not the pope right he doesn't have he doesn't have papal infallibility he doesn't have a lot of the characteristics that we see later and and they're not persecuting christians right because they are christians sort of Right. They're just Christians persecute, you know, Christians, you know, gaining uh, state power or trying to gain the power of the state. 
they the, the beginning they've lost the gospel but they still haven't got to the place that they get to in the sixth century so this develops so we would agree with that would we i couldn't disagree yeah but sometimes we sort of we look at the situation and we just kind of think oh it's all the papacy we all in a sense buy into what the papacy says about itself now of course the characteristics of rome you know the pontifus maximus these titles and so forth they're going to gradually be adopted by christianity and by the roman pope right the roman bishop so that's that's going to happen now um so the satanic nature like we don't have spiritualism per se as a separate power in the sixth century right we have the papacy but we don't really have the king of the south yet would we agree with that repeat that please so in the sixth century All right. we have the papacy but we don't have battles between the king of the north and the king of the south we don't have the king of the south yet the king of the south is going to arise in our in that time what we would call the spiritual king of the south in the french revolution well in the sixth in the sixth century you're saying that in in the time of Charlemagne? Yeah, we don't have the King of the South being described here in Daniel in that history at all. Okay. Right? You, you understand what I'm saying? Like we have the King of the South dealing with, with literal Greece. Egypt's going to be conquered. There is no Egypt, right? There's no symbol in 538 that we can say this is the King of the South because France isn't the King of the South, right? Right. Like there, there is no power that's the king of the south. The king of the south is going to arise at the end. So we have spiritual Babylon and we have the spiritual king of the south. Right. These are spiritual powers. When the pope is taken captive by France, that's only because the king of the south, the spiritualistic power now is is has come to be. And it's come to be because of the papacy. The papacy, the Jesuits, the Jesuits are really this spiritualistic power, right? Because if we think back to St. Ignatius of Loyola, I call him a saint, but that's what they call him. I don't believe he is. Uh, But if we go to St. Ignatius of Loyola, he's going to introduce spiritual formation, right? Right. Correct. These are the spiritual exercises. And it's this characteristic that comes from the papacy that's going to then be uh, externally at odds with the aims of the papacy. Does that make sense? I mean, it's okay. so much so because, because the, the papacy is the Pope, he's going to be taken captive by this power, which he in a sense is responsible for. And I don't think the Jesuits in and of themselves would have intended that to occur. Okay. Right. But Satan would have intended that to occur. So we know that spiritualism is the dragon power, and the dragon is Satan. So when when we look at at Revelation chapter 13, uh, we know that Ellen White is really specific about, well, in chapter 12 as well, the dragon power, right? So we know that the dragon in chapter 12, Ellen White says, that is primarily Satan, the great red dragon. But in a secondary sense, it is pagan Rome. And pagan Rome is going to give its power, his, his, his seat, and great authority to the beast, the leopard-like beast, of Revelation 13. Right? All right. So we know that, that, that the papacy itself has been given this from a characteristic that we we can attach to spiritualism that is paganism is spiritualism and spiritualism and christianity combine in that history from 508 to 538 right okay agreed right so so first the dragon gives its power to the papacy the papacy in this case is a pawn of Satan. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. 
And so the papacy, in its own mind, is a Christian power. I don't believe that the papacy, in its own mind, is a satanic power. Now, some people believe that the papacy understands the conspiracy that it's involved in, but I don't believe it does. I believe that Satan has duped the papacy as well as communism. That is, they have external goals that appear to be different. Well, they're the same goal. They both want to be uh, the rulers of the world. But Satan is behind this. So when the Jesuits, through St. Ignatius of Loyola, begins this, you know, the Society of Jesus, this secret society that is supposed to be furthering the, the aims of the papacy, it's really furthering the aims of Satan. They don't say Leola does not know that he's in control uh, by Satan. He just believes that that is God. Right. Right. But it's it's really spiritualism. And so 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 there's this this battle going on between spiritualism, which which comes from paganism, which is inherited from Babylon that that makes makes this. The papacy become this dragon power, right? It, it's connected to the dragon power, let's say. So it's going to be taken captive by, you know, General Birthday, Berthier on February 15, 1798. And that's because the dragon power is really behind what's happening. It's not a man who's behind what's happening. It's Satan who's behind what's happening. And then when we see that the United States makes an image to the beast we know that there's two there's two things that have to happen. It has to reach its hands across the abyss, right? And it has to join hands with the Roman power by reaching across, what's, what's the other word? There's the abyss, the gulf, right? Now, Ellen White switches those. We know she has two different statements. Uh, one where the United States reaches its hand across the gulf to join hands with the roman power and the other one that reaches across the the abyss to join hands with spiritualism and the other one where she says reaches across the gulf to clasp the hand of spiritualism and reaches across the abyss to join hands with the roman power so she switches she doesn't switch the order of the gulf and the abyss but she does switch the order of the Roman power and spiritualism, right? Okay. So, and, and the question, why sh does she do that? When you look at the context, um, you can see that there's a different context. So we, we discussed that before, and I can't remember what specifically the contexts were. But there, she's not talking about the same thing. So she, she switches them for a reason. And we might have to look at that in more detail again. But, but the point that we have here right now is that we can see, if we go back to this historical application, that Rome becoming the king of the north is, is something that, uh, that, that there's first is a, a characteristic that has to arise in that history that is from Babylon. So if we look at Babylon as spiritualism, so, Let's even just kind of break this down a bit more. So we have we have Babylon, Medo Persia, and Greece. Now each of these has different characteristics. Now we have a characteristic that Babylon has that we often focus on, and that is the pride of the power. What does that point us to? The temple in Jerusalem. No, the pride of his power. Well. Oh. I'm, I'm looking at the pride of the power of the children of God. At that time, it was the, it was the temple in Jerusalem. Okay, yes. But, but we, we would take pride and go back to Satan. Right. Right. So, so there's a satanic characteristic that Babylon has. And, and we know that Babylon is mysticism, right? It's correct. You know, astrology, um, you know, and that's where we get 666 from, because there's 36 divisions of the sky, 36 constellations, right? You add one plus two plus three all the way up to plus 36, you get 666. And, and so this becomes this mystical number. 
and and 666 years are going to connect the siege by by Babylon and the siege by Rome, Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. So there's this characteristic. Now, when we think about Medo-Persia, is Medo-Persia a dragon power? Well, we could say it's paganism, right? But it's not the paganism of Babylon. I mean, what, what's the religion of, um, of Persia? Zoroastrianism. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I usually, yeah, um, Zoroastrianism, I guess, is. Now, what exactly is that? I've never understood it, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know much about it, right? Uh, we just generally, when, when we see um, Persia conquer Babylon, it, Persia doesn't change the gods of Babylon, right? Because that's not the role of Persia. It's, it's not really a religious power. That's not what it's exercising. Its characteristic has to do with the law, right? It has, it's more an administrative um, power. You know, the laws of the Medes and the Persians. And, and Media Persia, even though we can say that, you know, the Jews are captive to Persia. I mean, really, Persia gives them their freedom. I mean, they, they get their own administration. They get their temple rebuilt. They get their city rebuilt under Persia. They're not really in captivity to Persia. They get freed from captivity by Persia. But it still is a world kingdom. Now, when Greece comes along, now Greece, what is its characteristic? Reliance on scholastic achievement. Yeah, so it's reason, logic, philosophy, right? Now, it, of course, is still pagan in, in a certain sense, right? But, but it, it's, it's not worship, and it does have this philosophy around the gods and so forth, right? So it still has all of those things. But, that's, but it's, it's in a different manifestation. And, and in some ways, I mean, what Greece has brought to the, the Western world, I mean, still exists in the way that, you know, we, we do education. No, it's not, it's not, it's not uh, the education of the Bible, right? It's, it's humanism. It's a different sort of way of looking at things. And it is affected. There's a, there's, um, a conflict between how God says education is going to occur and how and how Greece and man says education occurs, right? So it, it becomes part of the philosophy that creates, that we would see in uh, the interpretation of the scriptures by the, the scholars, right? The critics, we would often say critical scholarship. And that's going to come from Greece. But But it also has some characteristics which, are really kind of the found foundation of Western civilization to some degree, right? So each of these powers contributes to what exists today. And we don't reject all of the things that, you know, Babylon, Medo, Persia, and Greece give to us, right? We have governments and we have kingdoms and we have um, laws, you know, we have this civil authority and we have logic and reason and education. But these have all been distorted from what God's original purpose was. Now, Rome is going to take all of these and bring them together. Okay. Right? Because Rome is a syncretistic power. Right? It, and that characteristic of papal Rome, of pagan Rome, continues with papal Rome. And that's why you're going to see when you have this papal beast in Revelation 13... It's a composite beast, right? It has, it looks like a leopard, right? So it's spotted like a leopard. It, it has the feet of a bear, has the mouth of a lion, right? The bears, Medo Persia, the lions, Babylon. And what characteristic, particularly, is the characteristic of Rome in 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 the composite beast, right? Because it's a it, there's a beast that has. Um, says saw a beast not like unto a leopard it's the feet the feet of a bear and his mouth is the mouth of a lion 
and the dragon gave him his seat, his power, his seat, and great authority. So the characteristic that comes from pagan Rome is this power, seat, and great authority. Right. Okay. So, so we can see that the dragon power is pagan Rome. So pagan Rome is going to pass that on to papal Rome. And, and this is what occurs in the 6th century. So the dragon power still is behind the papacy, but not until that, that change occurs, right? Definitely, I mean, we can say the seat, you know, when the seat moves from uh, when, when uh, pagan, pagan Rome moves its capital through Constantine from Rome to Constantinople. Um, the power, where do we put that he gave him his power? That's 508, right? Right. And then the great authority, that's going to be 538. But some people try to give different dates for some of these things. Now, he do, that great authority is not the dragons to give. That is, pagan Rome doesn't have that. That is a religious authority, which is not his to give. His power that's his to give his seat. That's his to give, but it doesn't say and his great authority it just says great authority. So the papacy becomes the papacy in the sixth century. Correct. Okay. But it has something that's been given into it by this dragon power, which is paganism and paganism is spiritualism, right? Very much. Yeah. So, so it's natural that, that the papacy is going to have a characteristic within it that is is satanic, and that's going to be become manifest. So Satan is really the one behind what happened in the French Revolution and what happened in the Communist Revolution and what's happening in the world today. And yet each of these powers believes that they're working towards some goal. The United States, apostate Protestantism, they have a goal, right? And these are their their goals are global, right? Right. They're seeking to control the world. In the United States, if we go back like to the Cold War, what the United States believes that they're doing is that they're trying to bring democracy to the world. This type of civilization where we have the freedom of of religion and we have freedom of speech and, and all of these things. But yet, when the United States becomes Babylon, which which the United States is that beast that has two horns like a lamb, right? The separation of church and state, you know, Protestantism and Republicanism, it's still going to end up speaking like a dragon. So we can see that that dragon aspect exists within the beast and the false prophet. So we have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, but Behind all of that is Satan. So, so all of this we've said so that when we can look at Daniel chapter 11, we can see that when Rome exalts itself to establish the vision, this is pagan Rome. This is the power that is inherited spiritualism from Babylon. And that's why it's the sons of the robbers of thy people. Rome is inherited that from Babylon. It's not just that it's because Rome is not a descent, a descendant of Greece. Right? Correct. Yeah, and it's not a descendant of Medo Persia, but it is a spiritual descendant in some ways of Babylon. Right? right. One is one is all of these are pagan, but we know that that pagan Rome is really um, interested in the characteristics of Babylon. It's going to use a lot of these characteristics of Babylon. But the other thing that's interesting about pagan Rome, now we have Mithria, Mithris, Mithraism. I'm not, how, how do you say the word? Mithridatism. Mithridatism? Because uh, I, I don't usually say that word out loud. I just read it. <laughs> Okay. So we have this mystery cult that becomes really popular in Rome and 
And it's a type of religion that is syncretistic. That is, it takes different aspects of Babylonian religion and also of Egypt, right? All right. And Egypt is, of course, spiritualism as well. So and we have two, we have two powers that are really spiritualistic powers that are God's enemies. We have Egypt in the south, right? So long before we have Greece, we have the king of the north and the king of the south, long before we have those symbols. We do have Egypt. Egypt's in the south. It's an enemy. It's the kingdom of the south, right? That's the one that ta- attacks Israel from the south. And we see this in, in, during the time of Babylon. You know, you have Babylon is going to arise in um, what we call the Neo-Babylonian Empire when it begins its 70 years of dominance of the Levant. <clears throat> and, and, and that's going to happen with the end of Assyria, right? So in 609 BC, we have you know, Josiah, King Josiah is going to die when he tries to fight against Egypt. And Egypt is going to put um, uh, Jehoahaz on the throne of Jerusalem with the death of Josiah, right? Egypt is the king of the south. And then you have this king of the north um, is going to then be Babylon. No, it's Egypt was fighting against Assyria uh, and Babylon was was taking advantage of that with the weakening of Assyria. So then Babylon then becomes the power. It conquers Assyria. Egypt doesn't really successfully conquer Assyria. Correct? Right. Okay. And so you have this king of the north and the king of the south historically. Now, when Greece divides, then that king of the north and the king of the south are going to be used as symbols to represent these kingdoms that are divisions of Greece. But Greece didn't exist as the king of the north and the king of the south at the time of the Babylonian captivity in 607. Right? And we're still going to have that. Ba- we're going to have, even after Daniel's taken captive, uh, you're going to have this battle between Babylon and Egypt. And, e- and Egypt's going to be defeated by Babylon. So, we could also make the case, so we've never thought of this before. I've never thought of it before. Maybe other people have. But when we have that, that battle with the fall of Assyria, Assyria is the king of the north as well, right? Correct. Now, Egypt is going to conquer Assyria in a sense, right? It's going to bring about the end of Assyria. So we have the Battle of Raphia. We have Daniel. 11 verse 40 but Egypt's only going to temporarily conquer Assyria because Babylon's going to come in and then become the king of the north and it's going to then conquer Egypt and it does so when when does when does the neo-babylonian empire conquer Egypt it's kind of a trick question isn't it about 590 um Okay, so we initially have the Battle of, um, and I keep trying to think of the name of it. Uh, Carchemish? Yeah, Carchemish, right? That's going to be in 605. So Babylon begins its 70 years in October of 609 with the fall of Assyria. It becomes the king of the north, even though it's really Egypt that brings about the end of the king of, kingdom of Assyria. Babylon steps in just to take its place. And then Babylon's going to defeat um, Egypt. Now, Egypt is the one that put Jehoahaz upon the throne, right? Nebuchadnezzar is going to come in 607. Um, and, and Jehoiakim also has been put upon the throne by Egypt, by the way, right? So you have Jehoahaz. And then you have Jehoiakim, and he's put on the throne by Egypt. Um, But Nebuchadnezzar is going to conquer Israel, right, Judah. And 
Judah is then going to be in submission to Babylon. And that's going to happen in stages, I guess we could say. But in 607, when Daniel's taken captive, Nebuchadnezzar, who's the crown prince, he's he's going to be the, be the one that causes the Babylonian captivity, not his father, who's still alive at that time. But his dad dies in 605, while we have the Battle of Carchemish, which is a battle between Egypt and Babylon. So Egypt then is defeated. But Egypt also is further going to be defeated later on. Right? So it's... So, so to say, when was Egypt defeated? I'm, I'm just referring specifically to 605. So two years after the Babylonian captivity has begun. So we have a king of the north and the king of the south there as well. And the king of the south is Egypt and the king of the north is Assyria and Babylon, right? Because they're the kingdoms that come down from the north. So we can see the parallels there of battles of Raphia and Paneum that happened later with Greece. These have also occurred in the time of the Babylonian captivity. And also, even earlier, we have that happening, not so much with Egypt, but, you know, we have symbols of the king of the north and the king of the south that go back to the kingdom of Israel and Judah. So, so this idea of the king of the north and the king of the south, when Uriah Smith tries to say, well, the reason why it's called the king of the north is because they have the territory of the king of the north. That's actually not why. Mm. Right? Correct. Okay. It has to do with these earlier characteristics, why they devolve into north and south. Because Syria is controlled by the kingdom that's in the eastern section of the compass. Right? It's going to be, it's just, even though, Syria is in the north. It's going to be controlled by the east. But it's the symbol of the king of the north has to do with this these earlier symbols. And then when we get finally to what we're studying here, um, we have uh, the robbers of thy people exalting themselves to establish the vision. We know that this is a power that's the sons of the robbers of thy people. And that means it's the sons of Babylon. Rome is representing this, this power, and they need to exalt themselves because this vision here is the kazone. Right. And that kazone has these characteristics that are not just that it's a period of 25, 20 years, but it's tying the, the end and the beginning together. And if Rome doesn't arise, then you wouldn't have the end and the beginning tied together. You need to have what Rome is going to do, and, and that's going to be described as we go through these verses. Rome is going to make a league with God's people, right? It's then going to have a siege in 63 BC, which is then going to... the. That is, Jerusalem is going to be captive once again. <clears throat> we could say, really, that, um, I mean, Greece does, you know, take captive Israel, but in a much different way than Rome did or Babylon did. And definitely, Media Persia isn't really ever taking Jerusalem into captivity. I mean, they're they're under its dominion to some degree, but... Media Persia gives it, or Persia gives it its freedom, right? Okay. So, and 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 we know under Greece, when Rome comes in, uh, Ju the Judea is an independent state, right? And and you can see it; its its independence uh, from Greece develops over time. You know, I mean, the fact that it makes a league with Rome shows that it has some independence in order to do that. And, 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 and by 129 BC, Judea is completely independent. There, it's, it's not controlled by Rome or by Greece. But Rome is going to come in because of this league. Rome has its plans and powers and it grows and it's going to develop to the point that they actually are going to conquer this nation that they have a league with. They're going right. to conquer, um, yeah, Judah. Right. 
So, so these little details really are important to understand that uh, when, when we have, we have Scopus here, we have Rome exalting itself to establish the vision. It's going to support Egypt because it doesn't want this other power, Syria, uh, to conquer the whole area and become more powerful than it. But then it says in verse 16, but he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will. Now, so he is who in verse 16? King of the north. No. Well, it, yeah, it's going to become the king of the north. The he becomes the king of the north. Right. That's that's going to be Rome, pagan Rome. Right. Correct. OK. And. And he comes against him. Who's him? In my simplistic mind, the king of the south. Right. So at least that's the way that I would look at it, that he's not coming against the king of the north. But in this context, he comes against the king of the south. He shall go, do according to his will and none shall stand before him. That is, the king of the north is not going to stand before him and neither is the glorious land going to stand before him. So the, basically, here again, the king of the south is not going to stand against Rome, and neither will the glorious land stand against Rome. And neither will the king of the north. Because Rome becomes the king of the north when it defeats the king of the north. Rome takes the position of the king of the north when it then defeats the existing king of the north. Right, yeah. And, now, and we put that at 191 BC. Correct. Okay. Yeah, because now, verse 15 is going to be addressing uh, 200. Correct. And then nine years later, we have Rome becoming the king of the north. Now, okay. I'm not trying to... I I'm not trying to... Go ahead, Ron. So you're saying that Rome comes in uh, seduce Syria, right? That's the king of the north. Yeah, in 191. In 191, Rome, Rome conquers Syria. Mm -hmm. All right, that's my question. I just want to make sure I'm hearing it right. Okay, but on, on that point, I'm, I'm going to ask, my question from a point of history, because I don't know that I yet agree with them conquering Syria. In 191, which we addressed, and thanks to Brother Stephen, we understand it as being a midpoint within the 70 weeks of Daniel 9. Yeah, 1207, uh, 217 years uh, is uh, on either side of that midpoint. Yes, agreed. Yeah. Agreed. But 191, Rome defeated Greece at Thermopylae. Mm -hmm. Now, consider this point. And we have this in the second paragraph before us. As Smith is stating, the same power that was also to stand in the Holy Land and consume it. Rome became connected with the people of God, the Jews, by alliance in B.C. 161, from which date it holds a prominent place in the prophetic calendar. The point that Smith is overlooking, Rome defeats Greece in 191 at Thermopylae, mm -hmm. the same area where Greece defeated Media Persia. Thereby, mm -hmm. there was a 30-year period before Rome was taking the full stage as the world dominant power. Is this 30 year period of Rome at this point connected to the 30 year period between when paganism in 508 was being removed and papalism by 538 was being, was, was ascending. 
Well, we have the 666 years that tie 158 to 508. Sure. Um, then we have three years uh, from 161 to 158. And then you're saying there's this other 30-year period. Right. So, we have we have a 30-year period with Rome pagan ascending. And then we have a 30-year period where Rome pagan is descending and Rome papal is ascending. Stephen, do you have any thoughts on this? If you're listening carefully. Yes. Um, I haven't really considered the 30-year period. Okay. From 191 to 161 for as any of any sort of significance, although it is there to some level, but it sort of depends on where you're marking Rome defeating Greece because you could pull out a lot of dates out of the hat. Uh, it's yeah. just what battle yeah. you want to put, choose, you know, because there was battles going on all the time. Yeah, so, I know. Well, so people. That time. But but we have the symbolism here of a chiasm, right? With 30 years attached to the center of that chiasm as a mirror with the chiasm of the two 1260s with the 30 years prior to the middle. And this one has the 30 years after the middle. Does that make sense? Um, just said again, sorry. So you have the 217 years and then you yes. have the middle. 191 BC, and then you have 30 years following that. In and then that chiasm is going to end, you know, in you know 30 AD, right? Or not 30, 27 AD, right? Yes. Okay. And then, and we know that that that's connected to Christ's chiasm. Yeah, it's connected to his 70 70 weeks, but you know, which. The twelve two twelve sixties are a counterfeit of that week, and there's a thirty years connected to the beginning of Christ's chiasm, and then you have thirty years from five hundred eight to five thirty eight that connects the center of the twelve sixty chiasm, right? So you can visualize that, Stephen, pretty easily. I need a pen and paper. A little work on it. Okay, so um, yeah, I think you'll probably find something there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I'll look into it. But, uh... Okay. Yeah. yeah, so these these different periods of 30 years, because they're connected to, to a chiasm in some way or other, um, but especially the ones that are connected to the center of the chiasm, which is what you're pointing out, Dwight, right? Right. Yeah. And, and they occur in a mirror fashion. Correct. Yeah, so, so I think there's something there. And, and the Christ's 30 years. And uh, maybe even Joseph's 30 years uh, might have something to do it. Because remember, Joseph's 30 years are, are connected to these chiastic structures as well. So, so it's, it's kind of interesting. So maybe Stephen can put that together. But, but our, so our main point here was trying to address uh, Scopus. So Scopus isn't really Roman, but he's he's involved with the choice the choicest people with these elites which can parallel what we see with spiritualism with globalism and its relationship to the papacy in our time all right does it does that make sense i think you're making a valid point yeah so so i think that the choicest people that that's that's relating to this this characteristic. We could say it'd be um, when it comes to uh, papal Rome, they're going to have the Jesuits that are and 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 here, you know, Egypt is going to um, be supported by this this power that comes from from Rome. That's that that Rome is using to try to support Egypt, uh, but that's going to. Um, that 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 becomes a thread that carries through all of these lines of prophecy. So in in our day, when when the, when the Soviet Union is attacked in 1989, the Soviet Union is the inheritor of this atheism. But this atheism goes all the way back to Satan, right? Exactly. Yeah. 
And it's, it's a thread that goes through all of history that, that Satan's purposes are trying to be worked out through these world kingdoms, through these state powers in opposition to God's people. And, and the papacy itself isn't really in control of what's happening. It's Satan that's in control of what's happening. But these, all of these powers, in a sense, are satanic. Spiritualism, satanic. The papacy, satanic. And apostate Protestantism that makes an image to the beast becomes part of this satanic power. That is, it, it connects to these two powers. And, and the fact that Ellen White gives uh, the gulf and the abyss that that those always exist in that order, but what 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 reaching across the gulf and the abyss represent are two different things. Is not just some accident of her writing. No, right. It there there's a context there, and the context I remember one was a civil context and one was a religious context, but I don't remember exactly the details. But maybe we can, you guys can examine some of this stuff the next couple of days. So I won't be here for the next two days, but uh, but I will be back on Thursday and I'll, I'll try to listen to what you guys discuss here. So hopefully this was a profitable um, sort of brainstorm on this problem. I think it, you know, the, the purpose is to, to try to help us to more directly identify a lot of you know, who are we talking about? as we go through these these points. Yeah, and because we have this historical application, but we know that it relates to the present truth application, not in some arbitrary way. That right. is, you know, we're not just creating some application. We're not part members group where we can just make stuff up. Right? We we have to have the historical application correct because history is being repeated. We're not simply taking things from the past and, and creating our own parables, so to speak, uh, to get whatever we want. Right. I don't know. So hopefully people, hopefully you guys can sort this out for the next couple of days. But I, I think this, for me, this is helpful. I mean, it's me thinking out loud to some degree, but uh, without, without, you know, it, when we're here together, it's like things come together uh, more than when I'm just thinking about this on my own. Right. Okay. Okay. Does anyone else have any other thoughts, comment, or question with what we've addressed today? All right. Shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we've been able to spend together. We ask, Father, for your guidance through the rest of this day. We also ask, Father that you be with Theodore as he travels, watch over him, grant him traveling mercies, return him to his home safely. Direct us each one today. Show us that which you would have us to do, that we may more clearly and directly give glory to your name and to your character. Help us to these ends. Bring us again together tomorrow. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.